Oh, he. Yeah. Manly thing to do. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> My husband would do. Oh, yeah. so you guys over there I'll be there hot. at the uh, university. He's eager to just. Is that tomorrow? Uh, you want to see what we worked on over the weekend? Oh, yeah. I'm trying to fix up our house. I was going to say, did you ever go look at those other houses? No, because I had a heart to heart with my husband. And he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to. Looking forward. New York City. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. This, this is what our fireplace looked like. I called Nina after we made this. Her about it. As you know, she's oh, so now. Oh, I like that better. Yeah, isn't it better? <laughs> and then we're gonna paint this black. I mean, no. Yeah, it'd be it's awesome. Like this back wall. No, no, oh, just the. I was like, I brought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the girlfriend just like, yeah, I had a brass one and I painted it black. What happened to this house? He just doesn't want to leave that house. Yeah. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. No. You guys should go on to get, the, uh, get our friend on the phone today. Out on the phone. Uh, email. email. Did he respond? Yeah. I'll let you know. Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order on Monday, September the 4th, 2018 at 7 p.m. I certainly want to welcome all of you all who are here in attendance today. Could I ask you to please join me in pausing for a moment of silent meditation? Thank you. Council Member Reese, uh, could Thank you Mr. read Mayor. us the pledge? Good evening, colleagues. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. If, if you're able to do so, and if it's your practice, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask the clerk if she would please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. And Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to proceed with our uh, ceremonial items. Good evening, everyone. Our first ceremonial item tonight is a very important and significant one for our city, uh, and as well as for many of us as individuals. I uh, am here tonight at this podium to uh, present a proclamation memorializing the life of Dr. Fail Wynn, Jr. And before I call up uh, his wife and son to join me, I do want to say just a word of my own experiences with Dr. Wynn. I was fortunate enough to serve on the board of the Durham Tech Community Foundation for 21 years. Uh, I chaired the board for many years, uh, and under the tutelage of Fail and Lou, uh, really, really uh, enjoyed that board, both my leadership position and my service on it for many years. And Steve Toller was on that board, I think, we resigned at the same year, and I think you'd been on even longer than I had, Steve. I will tell you that it was a very unusual board meeting. Here was the thing that happened to that board meeting. It was always an hour. It was never an hour and one minute. It was always an hour. It ran like clockwork, and great things happened on that board. Here's another thing that happened at the meeting. The room would always be full 
Durham Tech employees, all of us trustees will be sitting around the will be sitting around the table. But there will be all these Durham Tech employees and students out there as well in the room. And Fail would go around introducing each by name to us, telling them what they did, telling us what they did, knowing something about everybody and having something special to say about everybody. One year, uh, one, one of the meetings I brought my boys with me because I had my boys that day. I don't know, maybe Leo was working and I wasn't, uh, as Councilmember Reese has his daughter here tonight. And um, I brought the boys to one of the meetings and they all got to meet them. And I don't know, I think they kind of ran around crazy. Uh, but ever since then, all those years, every time he'd see me, he asked, how are Abe and Solly? How are Abe and Solly? He remembered their names and he would always ask something special about them. That was, I think, one of his most special qualities. I remember at his big retirement party, I must have been 300 people in that room, and I know every single person in that room felt the same way I did, that Fail had something special to say to them that night. Uh, and that's the kind of person he was. And then I want to say something about just one thing. We know all about that. I'm going to read in a little bit about some of his commitments, and uh, we're going to hear from Peggy and Rasan, but I just want to say one particular thing that has really been on my mind since he passed away. In January, maybe it was early February, I gave my State of the City speech, and I asked Fail to come and be recognized for the work that he was doing for a housing trust fund. And I remember how excited he was to do that work. And those of us who have followed that work and the money that he had already raised for our housing trust fund, Reginald has been in those meetings, that the tremendous work that he was doing to lead the formation of this very, very critical resource to Durham. And I know that he kind of considered that one of his uh, last projects at Duke that he was really going to push over the finish line. And I just want to say that we are going to finish that work. We're going to finish that work, not only for the city of Durham, but we're going to finish that work in honor of Fail and his leadership of that effort. This will, this will. Happen. So I know we all have our memories, but those are a few of mine that I wanted to share. And I'm going to now ask the family to come up and uh, join me here. And uh, I'm going to read this proclamation and present it. So... I think this is a beautifully framed proclamation, and thank you to the clerk's office for doing it. Great job. And I'm going to hand it to you because you, somebody besides me should hold it. I'm going to read this version of it, and then I'd love to hear some words from you all. Uh, I think before I do, though, I should say, I believe this is the first time Mayor Bell has been back in the house, uh, and, uh, and he's here to honor Fail as well. And I uh, just want to thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. Proclamation memorializing Dr. Failwin Jr. Whereas on the recent passing of Dr. Failwin Jr., Durham lost one of its favorite sons far too early. And whereas Failwin was born in Wewoka, Oklahoma on September 8, 1947, to Valerie Fletcher Wynn and the late Failwin Sr., retained a strong loyalty to his home state, which he often mentioned with affection. And whereas his passion for education and service never ceasing, he earned an undergraduate degree from the University of Oklahoma and then served six years as an officer in the U.S. Army, including a combat tour in Vietnam, following which he earned his master's and Ph.D. degrees from North Carolina State University, his MBA from the Keenan Flagler School of Business at the University of North Carolina. And whereas Dr. Wynn was named president of Durham Technical Community College in 1980 and became the first African-American community college president in the North Carolina system, serving 28 years in that position, 
during which time Durham Tech served tens of thousands of Durham residents and became a leader in providing training and instruction in high technology jobs. And whereas, after retirement from Durham Tech, he was named the first vice president of the newly formed Office of Durham and Regional Affairs at Duke University and greatly strengthened trust between Duke and the Durham community, supporting with Duke's resources and his own time and ideas a multitude of essential community organizations and causes. And whereas Dr. Wynn deeply loved Durham with all her strengths and challenges. And whereas Dr. Wynn served as a member of the board of directors of the Triangle Community Foundation, a member of the board of governors of Research Triangle Institute, and a member of the corporate board of directors of SunTrust Bank and North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, and was a founding trustee of the Keenan Institute for Engineering, Technology, and Science at NC State, and also served on the boards of the directors of the Research Triangle Foundation of North Carolina, the GlaxoSmithKline Foundation, and the Forest at Duke. <clears throat> and whereas Dr. Wynn was a member of the Alpha Tau Boule chapter of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, which was established as a support system for black professionals that focuses on educational and professional achievement, commitment to addressing needs in the black community, congeniality, cultural compatibility, and the potential to engage in good fellowship through this membership, Dr. Wynn shared fraternal bonds with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Charles R. Drew, R. Drew, and two of Durham's adopted sons, thank you, Dr. John Hope Franklin and former mayor, William V. Bill Bell. Whereas Dr. Wynn was a spring 1967 charter initiator, the University of Oklahoma Zeta Zeta chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated the first African-American intercollegiate Greek-lettered organization. Dr. Wynn exemplified the mission of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, which is developing leaders, promoting brotherhood and academic excellence, while providing service and advocacy for our communities. Like Dr. Wynn, the civil rights icon, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., NAACP founder and educator, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, and historian Dr. John Hope Franklin were also notable members of both fraternities. And whereas Dr. Wynn was particularly devoted to the cause of early childhood education and helped lead community efforts to greatly expand the number of children served in quality preschools. And whereas Dr. Wynn was a tireless advocate for affordable housing efforts in Durham and led a community-wide dialogue that will result in innovative collaborations with the city of Durham, Habitat for Humanity, the Durham Community Land Trustees, the Latino Community Credit Union and Self-Help to support and expand housing opportunities for Durham residents. And whereas, during the last year of his life, Dr. Wynn was in the midst of leading the effort to fund and establish an affordable housing trust fund for Durham, which is critical to the success of the, success of the city's affordable housing efforts, and to which, in his memory, we recommit ourselves to completing. And whereas, Thale Wynn was a good friend to many, many Durham residents, always greeting them with a kind word, his bright smile, and a sincere question about their well-being. And whereas he was a master storyteller with a prodigious memory and a great sense of humor and a Harley Davidson aficionado. <laughs> and whereas, in addition to his work life and community service, he was above all a loving husband to Peggy Wynn and proud, devoted father to his son, Rasan Fail Wynn. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shull, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the 4th of September, 2018, as Dr. Fail Wynn Jr. Day in the city of Durham, and hereby commend its observance to the residents of Durham in recognition that in the loss of Dr. Wynn, Durham has lost one of its first citizens and finest leaders. Witness my hand of the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this fourth day of September, 2018. Thank you. On behalf of my late husband, Phil Wynn, our son, Rasan, Sam, Phil's brother, mm -hmm. and his other brother, Michael Wynn, who lives in Louisville, Texas, his mother, Dr. Valerie Fletcher Wynn, I'd like to say thank you, and thank you to all of you who come out, who are out here tonight, and to the elected board uh, members, thank you for this consideration. Our family is very proud to receive this honor this evening. I am so glad to hear you say that you all are going to continue Fail's vision with the affordable housing. That was a regular conversation at our table. 
and all the projects that are going on here in the city. We have enjoyed being residents of Durham, Durham County, and I hope to be here for a long time. I am a North Carolinian, I was a true North Carolinian. I was born here and I have been here all my life. And when I met Fayel from Oklahoma, and believe it or not, only a few people know this, but I married the first person I ever met from Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but my biggest fear was that we would have to leave North Carolina because Fayel did talk a lot about OU football and I was so afraid we would end up in Oklahoma. <laughs> so I immediately start pointing out all the wonderful things about North Carolina, <laughs> its people, the universities here, and Fell was one of those people who thought education would fix everything. And my son and I have laughed um, recently about this. I remember whenever my son uh, would run short on money when he first went in the military. Phil was always there with a piece of paper, something else to read, to learn how to manage your money better. <laughs> no matter what was wrong with you, he would give you something about education. If you improved your education on this, you would do better. If you were complaining about a health issue, read this. You would do, you know, you can fix yourself. That's what he really believed education was very important to him. I remember when he came to Durham Tech, one of the things that he was mostly concerned about was employment for the citizens of Durham. We arrived here in Durham when a lot of the tobacco factories, a lot of manufacturing jobs were leaving this area and people were being displaced. We were meeting people everywhere we went who were talking about this and Fayel immediately st started trying to figure out how we can re-educate people and get them back in the job market. The other thing he was concerned about was benefits for veterans. Fayel was a Vietnam veteran. He was very proud of serving in the military, but he tried to educate uh, veterans about uh, going out and pursuing the benefits that they were eligible for when they came back. And one of them was go back to school and he did a lot of counseling with young men and trying to get them ready to uh, get into, the, uh, into an education program and to get into employment. Thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful um, accolade that you have bestowed on my past husband. Um, so um, thank you again, enjoy the rest of your evening and I think we are going to slip out Sam <laughs> in a few minutes, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. They're, you're a family of eloquent speakers. Mm. Also want to thank our friends from Duke University for being here. And uh, I did hear from Dr. Ingram. He wasn't able to be here tonight, but is looking forward to a ceremony at Durham Tech where Dr. Wynn will be honored there. So I know that many of you all probably don't want to stay for our entire meeting. You will not hurt our feelings if you decide to leave early. <laughs> I'm now going to ask Councilmember Reese to come. We have another ceremonial item before we begin our regular order of business. And I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Charlie Reese to come and do the honors. And yes, I believe, yes. Uh, Dr. Mr. Robert Thomas. Okay, great. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to read a proclamation from the mayor uh, declaring this to be National Recovery Month. Uh, with me tonight is Robert Thomas from the Recovery Community of Durham. He's going to accept the uh, proclamation uh, after I get done reading it, and maybe he'll favor us with a few words about how important this particular month is. <clears throat> Whereas behavioral health is now being recognized as an essential part of one's overall health and well-being, 
and whereas the cost of not encouraging mental health and substance abuse recovery is significant for individuals, families, neighborhoods, and the community at large. And whereas people in recovery strive to achieve healthy lifestyles, stable homes, meaningful daily activities, stronger neighborhoods, and contribute in positive ways to the larger community. And whereas the Centers for Disease Control reports that drug overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in the United States, with 64,000 lethal drug overdoses in 2016. Opioid addiction is driving this epidemic, accounting for 42,249 overdose deaths, approximately two-thirds of all overdoses. And whereas the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration reports that in 2017, 43.8 million adults experienced mental health, excuse me, mental illness, and only 44% received a mental <coughs> health treatment. And another 22.7 million adults were in need of substance abuse treatment, while only 10 to 12% received treatment. That, given these statistics, we must strive to reduce the stigma, shame, and negative stereotypes associated with brain disorders and help individuals, families, and the larger community learn to view them as we would any other medical condition. And whereas to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the Recovery Community of Durham invite all residents of Durham, North Carolina to participate in National Recovery Month. Now therefore I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2018 as National Recovery Month in Durham and call upon the people of Durham to observe this month with appropriate programs, activities, and ceremonies to support this year's theme, join the voices for recovery, invest in health, home, purpose, and community. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham this fourth day of September 2018 and is signed by Stephen uh, Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham. Thank you, and I've got um, uh, Mr. Thomas here to say a few words. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I have been on the phone almost all day talking about our <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> activities that are coming up this Saturday, uh, September 8th at Durham Central Park. <clears throat> really, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank the mayor and the city council for this proclamation and for once again reaffirming their support. Thank you so much. <clears throat> for recovery from mental health and substance use disorder problems in, in Durham. Um, I'm the chair of the Recovery Community of Durham. We are a group of volunteers that work together to support and promote recovery in Durham. We do that by providing peer-to-peer -peer support, information about resources, and hosting recovery events to demonstrate that people can and do recover in Durham. So we are hosting an event this, this, this Saturday in support of SAMHSA's designation of September as National Recovery Month. It will be at Durham Central Park from 2 to 6 p.m. We're going to have live music, uh, children's activities. It's a free, family-friendly event. And we will also have many inspiring speakers to demonstrate that recovery is possible. So I certainly want to invite, invite the mayor and the city council to attend, but I'm also speaking to the larger community because <clears throat> there is still too much shame and stigma associated with brain disorders. And that causes people to run and hide rather than seek treatment. And so we really need the larger community to come out and demonstrate support for recovery, that they understand that these are medical conditions for which there are medical treatments but this is a public health problem, not a criminal justice problem. And <clears throat> I think SAMHSA also reports that in any given year, 25% of families will experience some level of a mental health problem. What that tells me is everybody knows someone. This is no longer a secret. This is something that is out in the open. And <clears throat> by the way, the figures on the opioid crisis uh, <clears throat> the CDC just released numbers for 2017, and that figure is now 72,000 uh, individuals who overdosed. Uh, that's about 200 a day. And I think that's instructive <clears throat> because we can't assume that all of these people, no reasonable per person can assume that all of these people were weak-willed with lack of character and no moral willpower, uh, 
uh, I think it's also instructive that the CDC says that 80% of the people entering opioid use disorder treatment for the first time began their use through the use of a prescription under a doctor's care. They assumed that if they were following the doctor's instructions, they would not become addicted, but it is simply a fact of opioids that if you use them long enough, over a long enough period of time, there is certainly uh, every chance that they will become an addiction. So, what we want to do is, again, achieve parity with physical disorders so that people will look on these as nothing more than a medical problem that people should go seek medical treatment for. So we invite you all to come out on sat uh, <coughs> excuse me, Saturday, September 8th, 2 to 6 p.m. Please join us for our ceremony and support people in recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas, and thank you very much, Councilmember Reese. Thank you all for being here. I, ho I hope Bill Bell's not planning to leave after all the years that he tortured us. I think we ought to make him sit through this meeting, don't you? <laughs> Just pull a chair right up here, Mr. Mayor. Right beside me. There's plenty of room. Okay. All righty. Uh, we'll now move on to our through our agenda. Thank you all so much for being here. And I'll ask first, are there any announcements by the City Council? Do council members have an announcement? Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at the risk of monopolizing the proceedings this evening. I did want to bring greetings from the White Rock Child Development Center. Uh, on Friday, August 24th, I had the happy pleasure of attending a banquet in celebration of their 20th anniversary as a, a child development center here in the city of Durham. Uh, they asked me to deliver two messages tonight, which I will do so now. Uh, Dr. Jerry Head, who's the chair of the board of the White Rock Child Development Center, wanted me to tell uh, everyone on the council uh, that he has heard that the uh, motto of the city is great things are happening in Durham. Uh, he wanted us to know that uh, the White Rock Baptist Church and the uh, Ch their Child Development Center uh, are smack dab in the middle of those great things. So they uh, wanted me to share that message. The other message I got from his, Mrs. Elizabeth Frazier, who's one of the three founders of the Child Development Center. Uh, she is uh, north of 90 years old and um, was amazing. She spoke at length. Uh, at, during the banquet uh, ceremony, um, and she uh, asked me to pass along this message. It is a, um, a quote from a Quaker missionary that she delivered with a lot more gusto than I'm going to, but uh, it went something like this. I shall pass this way but once. Any good that I can do or any kindness I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Uh, let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. That was from um, Mrs. Elizabeth Frazier, one of the co-founders of the White Rock Child Development Center. Uh, just another one of the things that makes our city great, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Council Member. Any other announcements? Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to send a birthday shout out to the dean of our legislative delegation. Representative H.M. Mickey Mishaw is 88 years old. Uh, today. So I'm sure he's somewhere turning up right now, uh, if not watching these proceedings. So if you hear any raucous celebrations in our city tonight, don't be alarmed. It's, it's the dean turning up. Happy birthday, Representative Michelle. Thank you. I do want to say that we issued a proclamation for uh, Representative Michelle's birthday, which is uh, in the possession of uh, Omar Beasley here in the audience, and uh, looking forward to his reception of that. So thank you. Awesome. Any other announcements? Uh, I just wanted to share that I had the opportunity to present a proclamation for Mr. Lee Williams, a uh, gospel great in the community who was visiting Durham, North Carolina, and I really want to thank the crowd for, for really, I, I actually had no clue who, who Mr. Lee Williams is, I'm afraid, and uh, I really have become a fan. Great. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. All right, do we have any more announcements? Okay, uh, if not, then uh, I will move to priority items. Mr. Manager, any priority items? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. No priority items from the city manager's office. All right, um, Mr. Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, no priority items. All right, Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council, and city manager. I do have a priority item. 
And I'm honored to announce that the application deadline for the sesquicentennial Honors Commission closes this Friday, September 7th at 5 p.m. for delivered copies and midnight for electronically submitted applications. To date, we have received two applications. And I encourage you to contact your neighbors, your associates, and other interested parties about the opportunity. The Honors Commission is charged with making recommendations to council of the residents from Durham's first 150 years that will be honored during Durham's 150th celebration next year. And to find the application online, it's, it's very easy. There are three steps. You go to www.durhamnc.gov, to the Government tab, click on Boards, Committees, and Commissions, then scroll down to the application, Apply for the Board in gold. There's a gold button there. So I encourage all, and uh, we'd like to have a nice big group. There are five um, vacancies available, so we encourage all to submit your applications. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. So uh, please spread the word. We um, would love to have some more applicants for that uh, commission. It's going to be not only important, but fun and very uh, enjoyable work, I think. So thank you so much. All righty. Uh, we'll now move to the consent agenda. I'm going to read the items on the consent agenda. The uh, consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, members of the public or the council can pull items from this consent agenda, which will then be considered at the end of the meeting. Uh, item one of the consent agenda, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission appointments. Item three, racial equity task force appointments, and I'm going to pull that item for consideration at the end of the meeting. Item four, Durham City County Environmental Affairs Board appointments. Item five, Durham Board of Adjustment appointments. Item six, Government Alliance on Race and Equity GAIR Implementation and Innovation Fund Project Grant. Item seven, replacement buses from Gillig LLC for Go Durham Transit Operations. Item eight, Central Park Waterline Replacement Construction Contract Change Order number three. Does the mayor have uh -huh. a question on sure. number eight? On number eight? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll pull number eight. Uh, number nine, Sewer System Evaluation Survey Services, SSESS contract with CDM Smith for professional engineering services. Item 10, selection of financial advisor. Selection 11, bid report July 2018. Uh, item 12, design contract with tributary, tributary land design for the Rock Quarry Park upgrades project. Item 13, construction contract with Recreational Ventures, Inc., DBA Court 1 for athletic court renovations, Marion Road Park. Item 14, contract with Biz Library for e-learning course content training library. Item 15, contract SD 292 2018 unpaved road study. Item 16, contract amendment for South Elbury Stormwater Project Building Demolition Services Contract, SP 2017-01. Item 20, this item can be found on the general business agenda public hearings. Um, I will now accept a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items three and eight. So moved. It's been moved and seconded okay. that we approve the consent agenda with the exception of items three and eight. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We only have one uh, general business agenda item tonight, one public hearing. Uh, item 20, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment, FEMA Firm Updates. Thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to note that all required notification for this public hearing item has been performed and is on file for review. Uh, text Amendment TC 18003 is a technical update uh, to the Unified Development Ordinance, specifically Section 8.4 of the ordinance to adopt revised flood insurance rate map or firm panels issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA by October 19, 2018 as required by FEMA and state law. Uh, that is in order to maintain Durham's participation in the National Flood Insurance Program or the NFIP. The NFIP requires local communities as a condition of future federal financial assistance and federally backed property flood insurance to participate in the flood insurance program and to adopt floodplain ordinances consistent with federal standards to reduce or avoid future flood losses. FEMA implements the NFIP and the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management serves as state coordinator. <coughs> Once FEMA approves a flood map, a uh, floodplain map for the NFIP, each local government affected by the floodplain must incorporate the revised map 
into its floodplain ordinance. No new flood insurance coverage can be provided until that occurs. This proposed text amendment would adopt the firm updates containing uh, all of Durham County, uh, which are revised effective October 19, 2018, uh, by the effective date as required. There are some firm panels that are not being updated at this time, primarily those at the border with Granville and Wake uh, counties. Uh, those are anticipated to be updated, and there will be subsequent text amendments associated with those updates. The Joint City County Planning Committee reviewed the text amendment and had no concerns. The Planning Commission recommended approval 12 to 0 of the text amendment on July 10, 2018. As a reminder, City Council were required to take two actions. The first would be an action on the appropriate statement of consistency found as attachment A, and the second would be the action on the ordinance amendment itself, which is attachment B. Uh, thank you, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Graham Summerson of the City Stormwater Services Division is also here to answer questions. <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Stock. You have heard the report of staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And I'm gonna first ask if there are any questions for staff from members of the council. Any questions? If not, is there anyone here who has signed up to speak on this item or who would like to speak on this item? Is there one, anyone here who would like to speak? This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this item? If not, I'm gonna ask if there are any questions or comments from the council at this time. Hearing none, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We need a motion to adopt the appropriate consistency statement. So moved. And moved and seconded that we, <laughs> that we adopt the appropriate consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The consistency statement passes 7-0. Thank you. And then we have a mo we need a motion to adopt the ordinance. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Stock, thank you so much. All righty. We will now move to the two items that we have uh, need to uh, take up. From the consent agenda, the first is racial equity task force appointment. So I'm going to first recognize uh, Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, colleagues. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Um, <clears throat> I want to firstly uh, thank my colleagues for their their openness and willingness to um, go down this path of having a serious conversation in our city regarding racial equity. I particularly want to thank. Um, our Mayor Pro Tem, Jillian Johnson, for her leadership in this and for, for establishing really the context of this conversation uh, for us. And we're, I know the city is grateful to her for it. I did not have opportunity to be here uh, during the work session when uh, the names that appear before us tonight were, were settled on. I do, however, want to thank the, the council firstly for excusing me that day and for also for the incredible amount of hard work and thoughtfulness uh, that they put into this process. And the work has been thoughtful. And, and serious, uh, and it comes from a place I know of deep personal commitment on, on behalf of every person on this day as for inclusion and equity and diversity and progress. I, um, I'm going to make a recommendation uh, to our colleagues. I'm going to state what the recommendation is first, and then I'm going to say a little bit as to why I'm making it. I'm going to recommend that we do not vote tonight uh, on these names and that we take this issue back into consideration and to have further discussion about how we populate uh, this task force. Uh, as it stands now, if the action that was going, uh, that was slated to take place tonight goes forward, we will have probably just one African-American male uh, on this uh, racial equity task force. Um, in my assessment, uh, colleagues, uh, for a racial equity task force in a Southern American city, um, where nine African-American male applicants apply, for it to be just one African-American male on the task force, I think optically um, uh, is a shortcoming on our part. Here's the interesting thing, though. It's not by design. I think this is a teachable moment for us. This, this uh, situation actually shows us something important about uh, racial equity and the work of racial equity, and that is systems left to themselves, uh, institutions left to themselves will oftentimes present results or produce results that nobody had malintent for. Nobody directed it, nobody intended it, but it just 
came out that way. And I think it's, it's interesting that this is kind of an aha moment for us that the seminal trajectory setting event for racial equity in our city would bring us to a point where our, at least in my assessment, uh, the makeup as it stands uh, is probably not the trajectory uh, we want to start racial equity uh, work in our city with. I think the good thing is that we're under no timetable but our own. Uh, we're not under uh, uh, any, um, um, we're not being compelled by any government agency, no court order. Um, I think we would take the time, um, do the work, and have further discussion about how we populate uh, this racial equity uh, task force. Uh, I think this will be the first great lesson uh, for our city in doing the work of race equity. In the meantime, there is a working group uh, in our city uh, that should be uh, mindful of racial equity issues. Us, this city council. Uh, and as the first act of uh, putting together this uh, racial equity task force, I think we want to make sure that the trajectory that we put it on is reflective of the outcome uh, that we want. Um, there's nothing more important uh, than making sure that Durham uh, is a place that is safe and welcoming for all people, no matter what you look like, how you worship, who you love, what your race is, what your economic status is. But I will say that as the only African-American male uh, on, this, on this board, I am particularly um, sensitive uh, and locked in, to, uh, uh, locked in on the composition, what the composition of this board will be if we take action tonight and fill this 13th position, even if it is with an African-American male. I just think optically, uh, that a racial equity task force in our city with one African-American male on it when nine applied optically uh, would be viewed as a shortcoming by the people of our city. Uh, so with that, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to yield back and I'm going to respectfully submit uh, to my uh, colleagues. I don't know if we can do it on una unanimous consent or if we have to do a formal vote. I'm going to recommend that we do not vote tonight and that we have further discussion. Uh, and I know one thing I like to do as a leader is that when somebody comes up with something, give them a job. You know, if somebody speaks up, my organization say, okay, you got a job. So I, let me go ahead and, and preempt that. I'm willing to work um, with who, Mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor, through direction with whomever to have further discussion about what's the best way to make sure uh, that our racial equity task force looks like the ends we desire uh, for our city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, you, you've heard uh, Councilmember Middleton's suggestion, and I'm interested in uh, any comments that you have on this item. Council members? Councilmember Austin. Thank you. I'm just having heard, you know, my colleagues' uh, concerns. Um, I would feel comfortable um, postponing this vote um, if, you know, the other members of the council um, agree. Um, I think it's a valid concern, and uh, if it doesn't do any damage to the timeline that this task force has to work with, mm -hmm. um, I don't see um, any problem with postponing this vote or to, okay. to, to, to uh, address this concern in some way. I don't know what that answer is. But. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, any other comments? Councilmember Freeman. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councilman Middleton. I think this was part of that issue I was trying to raise in the work session when we talked about developing the format for how we would select folks in this committee and recognizing the current structure that all of this is under or the current um, laws that are in place that would prevent us from creating a system that would specifically point to who we want on this board. I think it's really important to figure out the way because that's what we said we would do to make sure that it reflects what we would like to see on a race equity task force. So I really appreciate um, Councilmember Mendelson's comments. All right, thank you. I think that uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a pretty clear direction set by my colleagues. I wanna appreciate Councilmember Middleton's comments. And um, I think that we were all uh, concerned when we saw the way that our votes did originally come out uh, and uh, appreciate uh, your, your giving us some more uh, uh, an, another thoughtful response to that, Council Member. Uh, if I, hearing no uh, objections, I'm going to uh, simply ask that this be, that we refer this back uh, to the next work session. I don't believe, uh, Mr. Attorney, we need to vote on that, do we? 
All right, so we'll, we'll just refer this item back to the next work session. Uh, and in the meantime, Council Member Middleton, I'm gonna take you up on your offer. <laughs> and I, I'm gonna suggest that you have some one-to-one -one discussions uh, in the next couple of weeks with each of us and, uh, and uh, so that we can advance our thoughts. And if there's anything that you wanna put out in, in, in writing in an email that goes to all of us uh, that, uh, you know, to further that, uh, however you wanna do it. But if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind helping uh, lead us in that, that will be awesome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I wanna just place leadership in quotes. I wanna uh, pay all due deference to the work that's already been done uh, by our, our committee that's been working on and my colleagues, Councilor uh, Caballero, and, and certainly the, to the Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so I certainly will, I'm gonna start with them. Uh, yeah. If that's that's all right. But thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, thanks to my yeah. colleagues as well for your openness. I'm sure we can come up with a great solution uh, and uh, appreciate it. Thank I'm now, you, however, gonna let you all know uh, one thing that I am planning to do when this does come back to us. Uh, and that is, I, I, am, I am, as you all know, I'm tasked with nominating a chair for the committee and I will be nominating uh, Judge Elaine O'Neill as our chair. Uh, Judge O'Neill uh, is a person that applied for the committee, was chosen by us. Uh, and uh, however, it turns out uh, with the exact membership, uh, I have already talked to Judge O'Neill. She's willing to accept and very excited about it. Uh, but we won't, uh, I will be nominating her, but we won't be taking any action on that until we come up with the uh, membership of the committee and uh, our um, and are ready to take action on the committee and the chair. Uh, but I, I did, uh, I have let uh, some people already know that I was planning to nominate Judge O'Neill, so I think it's important to go ahead and, and say that here, out here in the public forum. So I'll be planning to do that uh, when, when we are prepared and hopefully we'll be back here. Uh, well, let's think about the timetable a little bit. I referred it back to the work session. That I means this Thursday, I don't believe we'll be able to hit that timetable. So why don't we say that we We'll uh, be back at the at the work session after next. September twentieth. Uh, sep September twenty fifth. September twenty. No, that's not right. Twentieth. I think twentieth. September twentieth work session. Uh, and we'll have this discussion, and we'll take it up the following. We'll we'll take up the membership and the vote on the chair at the following meeting. Everybody good with that? Thank you, colleagues. Okay, and we'll now move on to our last item. Uh, which is item eight, Central Park Waterline Replacement Construction Contract Contract Change Order Number Three. Uh, welcome, Mr. Greeley, and uh, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Council Member Freeman for her questions. Thank you. I honestly had a few questions about uh, a number of the items, but I really wanted to hit this one, and then I'll come back around. But I do have some questions for you as well, Mr. Bonta. Um, Mr. Greenlee, I'm not sure if I missed um, when this came through before, but can you explain what the change order process or how it works for your department? Um, certainly. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, Don Greeley, Department of Water Management. Um, the, the change order process is consistent with the, you know, the city's process. In typical construction projects, um, there's a contingency established for, for construction projects. That contingency is is usually is, is, is accompanied by the agenda item when the contracts are awarded, um, say for a million dollar contract, let's say. Um, if there's $100,000 of contingency, um, when that goes to council, you've authorized the city manager to um, have contingencies on the project. So if there's a change order, a small change order, um, that goes through, um, gets entered into on base, and then gets sent up to the city manager to ultimately to approve. Um, it's negotiated up front prior to the work being done. Um, when we have encountered work that's significant beyond what was awarded by council, then we'll come back to council for a change order to get authorization for that additional funding. In, the, in this case, there's infrastructure that's failing. Um, the most cost-effective solution was to actually add it to the existing contract, and it was well above the established contingency when the contract was originally um, awarded by council. Thank you. And I'm not... Um, trying to challenge whether the contract should change or should move forward. I'm kind of concerned on, I guess, how much further we go into into uh, this direction where you're focused. Well, pretty much this project is already approved and moving forward. You found something that was kind of, there was more work needed than we originally thought. And so we're spending an additional 2 million. 2.9, yes. 
2.9 million to correct that. And I'm recognizing that this area is a highly gentrifying area of the city and that, you know, there's a lot more pressure or I want to say development pressure in this, this region or in the central city area anyway. And I'm concerned that we're, where there may be other areas that might need to be addressed that we're not looking at that at the same time because this is already a project we're working on and so I don't want to, I'm not saying that this project shouldn't happen, but I'm concerned that we're, we're prioritizing, prioritizing based on the fact that the ground is open only. And I really want to know that there's more than that applied to this. We have an um, overall program for the water distribution um, replacement, um, especially in the, uh, the, the inner city. Um, we have roughly 167 um, miles of cast iron line, which is the oldest line in our system. You know, we started out by working all the water lines within the downtown loop. Um, we've moved into Durham Central Park. Um, this fall we'll be actually um, uh, bringing out, we finished the design for the water lines that are in the um, American Tobacco area, which extends pretty far east and west of downtown. Um, we recently um, went out for a large section of the water lines on the eastern side about, you know, um, away from downtown, um, which is about a $20 million project. Um, so I'd, I'd be happy to revisit and share those graphics with you okay? because we really moved well into East Durham and that's where we're kind of targeting kind of our next areas. Okay. And then uh, additionally, I had a question. I'm not sure who to direct this to, but there is, what I'm noticing is, I don't know if there's ever been a way to encourage uh, kind of NWBE uh, statistics or standards or a percentage, whatever it would look like to talk about with the regards to vendor and purchases. So Ms. Page, you wanna talk about the EBOP ordinance, please? Thank you, Mr. Greeley. And I apologize, I've been uh, trying to catch up. And, and this, this round of contracts kind of brought it to, to my attention. Like there were four more contracts that came in and looking at the statistics that were available, it looked like they were very low, like low diversity. There was some in, some that had quite a bit of diversity, but there wasn't any requirements for NWBE for specifically around purchases of vendors. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, <coughs> members of the council. Um, you actually <coughs> have observed something that is, is factual. Uh, we do not set specific goals around um, purchases of materials, apparatus, and supplies. But what we do is we analyze our actual um, use of minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, we keep a watch on it. We, we uh, ev evaluate it every quarter and determine where we are. When we last had a disparity study in 2016, it showed us the availability of minority and women-owned businesses in our market. So we were able to set some benchmarks and we started, we've started to look at how, you know, how closely we are to reach them. And, and we will be doing an annual report that includes purchases as well as the construction and professional services that you see uh, reported when we enter into uh, construction contracts. If I could just clarify, uh, Ms. Page, the, the, the council has adopted a, uh, an MWBE ordinance, and we have the benchmarks incorporated into that ordinance. Could you briefly just catch that since we yes. kind yes. of that it's, door? Yes, it's an equal business opportunity ordinance, and we have, um, that ordinance was adopted, I believe, in 2014, and we've been implementing it um, since 2016 after we, we, well, we actually had a disparity study in 2014, and so in, since 2016, we've been tracking and uh, I can certainly provide you a report that uh, demonstrates all of our benchmarks, all of our targets that we have for both uh, construction, professional services, as well as our uh, purchases of material, apparatus, and supplies, uh, and just general services. All of those categories have different, um, different benchmarks or different goals that we, we measure ourselves against. And then on a project by project basis, they're evaluated as well for availability. Is that correct? Yes, actually, in um, for any <coughs> any project that's more than thirty thousand uh, dollars, we actually look at the scope of work 
and determine whether or not there is opportunity for subcontracting. And if it is, we do apply those goals uh, to the project. Uh, if there is not a subcontracting opportunity, we still are looking to, to make sure we, uh, we inform uh, minority and women-owned businesses in the hub <coughs> database of that particular uh, opportunity to, to contract with the city, to be, to be the prime contractor, when, when, even when goals are not set for subcontracting. Thank you. And just to be uh, even more transparent, uh, just noting that I've been going through the contracts and looking, consistently looking at the workforce statistics that are available, and I just continue to be like floored by how many of the businesses we work with have zero people of color. And it's really just disturbing me. I, I, I just, I haven't found a way to, to make that like point as clear as possible that we've got to find a way to push a little bit more. And I'm not sure if it's something we need to do as a council with an ordinance or if it's something that, you know, that I need to have a conversation with uh, our city attorney about. But I, 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 I don't know what else to say. Like this is. Thank you, council member. I'm going to say something, uh, which is that, uh, I think this is a primary concern to all of us. Uh, and, and if you've, uh, you, you're, you've been at, you've been at work sessions now with us for almost a year. year. And, it's uh, and you, you certainly hear how many times I raise this question on individual contracts, how many, how many other times our colleagues are, and, and this is a big concern. We also do know that there are unfortunately some industries in which there are simply no vendors uh, with the, uh, with the, um, uh, no minority vendors who uh, uh, have the uh, technical expertise, say, for some of these areas. And I think that that is a bigger societal problem that we've got to solve with our universities, our education system, and also that we need to be thinking uh, as, as, a, as a city about how we're going to help uh, some of our folks who do have technical skills but don't have business uh, experience and capitalization uh, learn how to get that and help them with it. So and then also on the retail side of it as well, finding ways to connect with more minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses or local, you know, vendors. It's important to really hone in on each and every contract because, I mean, it's a, it's, if you're not even looking at numbers or statistics for it, then there's no way that, it's similar to the, to the conversation we're having about the race equity task force. If there's no, if there's no goal, there's no reason to look. And some of it, I mean, in most of the documents where it says zero uh, because or zero percent because we don't have our ordinance or anything in place, I'm not sure what we do about that. Okay, well, thank you. Well, this is to be continued. Any other comments, council members? Thank you. Thank you very much, council member Freeman and uh, Ms. Page and Mr. Greeley. Uh, I'm going to now ask for a motion on the uh, to establish the additional contingency funds for the contract in an amount not to succeed. No, I'm sorry. To authorize city manager to execute a contract change order and to establish additional contingency funds and to authorize the city manager to negotiate additional change orders for the contract if the total contract cost does not exceed $13,808,878.42. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, council members. Uh, and if there's no more work to, uh, there's no more business to come before this body, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 7.57 p.m. Thank you.